Well, hello there. I hope everybody is having a wonderful Wednesday. This is our monthly live Facebook class I do every month. I come in here and I teach on something that you guys voted on. So for those of you that do not know me, my name is Natasha Daniels. I am a child therapist. I specialize in anxiety and OCD. And I'm the creator and admin of this ever-growing, beautiful Facebook group. So I appreciate that. And every month I come in here and I teach on a topic that we all find very important. And you guys voted and you voted on how to find the core fear in your kids, which I think is an incredibly important topic because if you don't know your child's core fear, you really are taking shots in the dark and teaching our kids what their core fear is. It's actually really powerful too. So I'm going to get all into it. Um, I just want to give some updates before we get started. So welcome, Josh. Thanks for joining. And Michelle and Molly, I appreciate it. Um, as people are, and Lynn, thanks for coming in. As people are coming and finding my live, just some updates that are going on. So next week on Tuesday, I'm going to be doing my free three-part video series on self-care for parents who are raising kids with anxiety or OCD, back by popular demand. And you can catch that. I left links above so that you can join that. You'll get the links to the videos right into your inbox so that you can watch them whenever you feel like it. Don't miss that. That got a lot of um, great traction for people who were kind of stuck. So I'm hoping that that will help you as well. And I will be coming in next week and doing a lot of lives. So get used to seeing me next week because every day I'll be doing a video um, I'll be doing a Facebook Live on the video that you're going to watch that day and ask, answering your live questions and diving into it. We are actually going to have some contests, which could be kind of fun. So definitely join it and then catch the Facebook Lives. I will be emailing you with the dates that those are going to happen. And that you're going to see a lot this week. So catch that. And also the AT Parenting Community is going to be opening next week just for a week. So you can get on the wait list. The wait list will get a special offer. Um, at a lower price, so you want to catch that as well. Okay, so welcome Pam. Thanks for joining and Kyleen. We are going to be talking about your child's core fears. So I want to talk about why it's so important to understand your child's core fears. And as I'm discussing this, please feel free to leave comments in the section that are relevant to our discussion for today. Um, and I will definitely, I've gotten better at multitasking, and so I will go and answer your questions as we're going along. And I did get a couple of questions as well. Um, whenever we have a class, I put out a poll that has you vote on it. And then, welcome Molly, thanks for joining. Oh, Molly's, um, you're next on the podcast. So everybody should check out Molly's story. It's coming on Tuesday, I just realized that. And um, her fantastic book on helping kids with OCD called Practicing Being Brave. I always like to give a shout out because I love that book. It's on my bookshelf right there. So um, when you guys vote on a topic, I always put out a thread. You might miss it sometimes that says, hey, this is um, the topic that we're going to have. If you have questions, leave a comment. When you leave a comment, I'm sure to answer your question, even if you can't make it live. So try to look for those um, when you see that. So I did get a couple of questions and they're not completely related. None of them are actually completely related to the core fears. Some of them are, um, but I will get to those as well, but feel free to leave your comments. So let's talk about, we're going to talk about why you should find out the core fear, how to use it and how it's important and how do you even go about finding it? So I want to start out with why it's important to find the core fear. And a lot of times I would have to say, actually, most of the time, People miss this step. Even therapists miss this step. They go right into the symptoms of, oh, he's afraid at night. So let's just talk about how to get him to sleep in his own bed. Or she's afraid to go to school. So let's just talk about how to get her to go to school. Or, you know, he's afraid of germs. So, I mean, isn't that the core fear? Let's just talk about how to get him to not be afraid of his core, of, of being afraid of germs. And what I try to highlight to people is that, and if anyone has heard me talk before, you've kind of heard me say all this, so it'll be a good reminder is you want to dig deeper because the more we understand about what's driving our children's anxiety or OCD, the better we can either reframe their thinking if it's anxiety or, or provide really good exposures if it's OCD and good challenges if it's anxiety. So 
it's really important. And also, and we're going to get into it in a little while, but helping our kids understand and detect and analyze their own fears and patterns is so powerful because ultimately our job is to be a coach. Our job is to support our kids and cheerlead them from the side. But the ultimate goal, and this is the goal in my practice, this is the goal in the AT parenting community that I have, this is the goal when I teach you, is to give you the tools to help your children help themselves. Because you don't have the power to fix their issues. I wish we did, I would fix all three of my children. <laughs> but I only have the power to help them help themselves. And so when we learn these new tools and skills, it's not for our own benefit, it's to teach them how to do it themselves. So it's almost like by proxy, like I teach you something and then you teach your kids this. It doesn't stay with you. So teaching our kids how to discover their core fears, what is a core fear is really important. I'm gonna talk about how to teach them that as well. So it will completely shape everything that you're gonna do with your child. And a lot of times I think parents have kind of this, um, I don't know, it depends on the parent, but a lot of us have this hands-off mentality of, I'll just bring my child to the therapist, my therapist will deal with it, and then I'll come home, and my, my child and my therapist will, you know, they'll do the homework, and then I'm check that box off that I've helped my child. And really, um, that's not the case. As a parent, I'm a therapist and a parent, and so as a parent to a child, to three children with anxiety and OCD, I realize that it's ultimately my job to coach them in the moment, to teach them in the moment and foster their skills so that they can be um, independent and empowered on their own. So I have a big role to play and so do you guys. Um, as a parent, I have a big role to play. And that role is very defined. It's to build up their skills to help themselves, not to fix it for them. So a little bit of a soapbox, but I just wanna preface that as we discuss core fears, because really the ultimate guide, the ultimate goal is to help our kids find out their own core fear. Okay, so how do you find that out? So a lot of you might be thinking that you know the core fear, um, and feel free to leave in the comments what you think your child's core fear is, and I can help some of you dig deeper. I'd like this to be interactive as it possibly can. So let's talk about what your child's core fears are. You can throw some of them out there. Um, I like to share my own stories too. So I'll tell you my children's core fears, and I'll talk about how we get to those core fears. So I have one child who has a core fear of um, throw up. Actually, I have two kids with the fear of throw up, and I have a child who has a fear of pee and having accidents, and I have a couple of kids who are afraid of social embarrassment. I know that's one of my main, main core fears that I've been working on for a while. So we wanna figure out what your children's core fears are as well. And I'll give you an example about why this is important. So let's say we had a child whose core fear was um, being afraid to go to bed at night. And so you might say, well, they're just afraid of the dark, right? We're at the bottom of the core fear, right? Fear of afraid of the dark, so there we go. Actually, if you presented me with a dozen kids who are afraid of the dark, I would probably have 12 different core fears. Maybe not 12, maybe six. Maybe like half of them would have the same ones because they are like pretty common. But there's a lot of different reasons why a child might be afraid of the dark. Maybe they're afraid um, that there's a bad guy that's going to break in. Or maybe they're afraid that there's a monster in their closet. Or maybe they're afraid that they're never going to fall asleep and they're going to be so tired the next day. Or maybe they're afraid that something bad's going to happen to you at night. And so we might be assuming they're afraid of the dark, but really it's just what the dark means, which means bedtime, which means good night. They might be afraid that they're gonna die. Well, gosh, those are a lot of different core fears. If I approach the kid who's afraid that they're gonna die when they go to bed with a kid who's afraid of monsters or aliens, I'm gonna be speaking Greek. When I say to that kid who's afraid of monsters and aliens, don't worry, you know, you're safe. You're gonna wake up the next day. That's really not addressing their core fear. Or if I said to the kid who's afraid of death and dying, I said, don't worry, there's no monsters in your closet, we can go check. They're gonna be like, what are you talking about? So we don't wanna assume that we understand what's going on with our kids, right? We wanna ask. Um, so Ursula said, mine is afraid of academic failure. Causes her to not try at all, thinking totally black and white. So we'd wanna go further with that and we'd say, What's the worst thing that can happen to you if you fail academically? 
right? Um, and I'm going to say this ad nauseum, so it's going to get a little repetitive, but really, we want to keep saying what's the worst part of in any rendition that you can say. That's the, that's the gist of it. And so what would happen if you failed? Let's just go down that, like, you know, that worry road, right? A lot of times as parents, we don't want to do that because we think, oh my gosh, Natasha, we don't want to upset them further, but that's not being proactive. We don't want to be afraid of anxiety or OCD. We don't want to walk on eggshells around it. We want to know as much about this enemy as we possibly can. So we do want to dig further. And so I might say, Ursula, to your daughter, well, what would be the hardest part about academic failing? What does your anxiety say could happen? Or OCD, depending on your child. And get those meaty answers so you can connect the dots. Molly said, I'm having a real hard time figuring out my daughter's core fear. Lots of our OCD revolves around just right, or it's just gross. And when I try to dig for a core fear, we don't get very far. It's just gross. It just doesn't feel right. And I'm so glad you brought that up because that's a really good point. Grossness and disgust is the core fear. So with OCD, disgust, the fear of being disgusted, the fear of having that feeling of disgust, the feeling of it not feeling just right, the core fear with just right OCD is discomfort. A lot of times with OCD, the core fear is discomfort. And we get lost with that because people think, well, that's not a fear, but it is. So if I have an image that gets stuck in my head or a song that gets stuck in my head and I have OCD, the core fear is it's never going to get out of my head. If I see things, let's say I have an OCD issue around feet and I see feet and it makes me feel gross and disgusted, my core fear is disgust. Um, so the buck does stop there with that fear. And so when we're dealing with OCD, we want to desensitize her to the feeling of disgust. And so I have like fake boogers in my office and I have a lot of kids who are afraid of um, like feeling disgusted around seeing snot or seeing poop or touching something gross or even food just looking weird and um, things being sticky. Sometimes that's a feeling of disgust. And so we do exposures around that. Sarah said, my son is fearful of getting in trouble at school. He has anxiety, OCD, ADHD, and a tick disorder. His tics and impulsive behaviors are getting him in trouble. And so then, Sarah, I would go further and I would say, what do you, what's the worst thing that would happen if you got in trouble at school? I have asked that to a lot of kids and I get a lot of different answers. Some kids will say, well, I'm afraid of going to the principal. The principal's really mean. Or some kids say, I'm afraid of getting punished. And so they're worried about what will happen afterwards. Some kids worry about their reputation. I'm worried that other kids will think I'm dumb. Um, or bad. So we want to go all the way down that rabbit hole. Stephanie said, Miss Six says she's afraid to sleep at night because when she closes her eyes, she sees bad things. When I ask her what they are, she never tells me. She just says, I don't know, crying. So Stephanie, I would be cautious with her, but I would still dig further over time. So these things don't have to happen all in one sitting, all in one conversation. A lot of times with my kids, especially my son, who's homesick today, so I told him to be quiet. He's in the other room. Um, he's fine now. I think, he, whatever, it's a long story. But uh, you want to ask, like, what's going on? And so we want to do some breadcrumbs and you maybe talk to her about drawing it out. I know it's hard to talk about. How about you draw it? Because if we keep it a secret, then anxiety, did you say she has anxiety or OCD? You didn't really say. Because anxiety loves to grow and keep it secret. And that's actually a YouTube video I'm making for. I think it's for this week, actually, which is about secrecy and shame. Anxiety and OCD love secrecy and shame. And so even with a six-year-old, I try to like address that by saying, you know, anxiety doesn't want you to tell me anything. I feel like when I'm proactive and I tell kids that, hey, anxiety or OCD, depending on the child I'm talking to, they don't want you to tell me these things. That's their power. They're like best friends with you. They're like, don't tell Natasha. And I find when I disarm anxiety and OCD, kids will be more forthcoming. So maybe have her draw it or um, maybe have her act it out with puppets, whatever works for her over time. Teresa said, um, my son doesn't like to go to school because he's going to miss us, his parents, and he's afraid to be locked outside when he goes out to play, and he's afraid we're going to leave him there. Not sure what the core fear is. Well, you're, you're well on your way, and actually you had said that in your comment too, that your son's biggest core fear is being left at school or being left alone. He's never been left anywhere, so I have a hard time wrapping my mind around the fear or where it comes from actually an incredibly common fear super common I see that all the time in my um, I was gonna say my classes in my classes too but in my practice and you don't have to have an experience or a trauma 
for anxiety to create something. Um, anxiety is very creative. If you can think it, then it can be a fear. And being afraid that you're not going to be picked up or being afraid of being alone is a very, very common separation anxiety core fear. And so we want to go further with it and we say, because being locked out of outside when he goes out to play is still separation, right? Um, being afraid that you're going to leave him, that's still separation. He doesn't want to go to school because that's still separation. And so sometimes with kids with separation anxiety, there's an over-dependence on the parent. And so they fear if they're not with you that they can't function, that they won't be okay. And I don't know that about your son because we can't assume. And so I would, I would really explore that and I would find out, um, you know, what would be the worst thing that would happen if we did get separated? You know, what does your, and hopefully you have a name for your anxiety, but what does your anxiety say would happen? What does Mr. Worry tell you would happen if you're not with me? And then we would go from there. So uh, Ursula had to go to an IEP meeting. I am sorry to hear that. Hopefully you can watch the replay. Joanne said, afraid of dying in her sleep and not waking up and being ill. Okay, so Joanne's got some really good core fears. I mean, you can't go further than that. Um, although I, this is going to sound super weird, but I do ask kids, what's the worst part about dying? <laughs> I know that seems totally bizarre, but I want to get the meat of it because for some it's the pain. Um, I was just talking to my eight-year-old last night, and she's developed a fear of dying recently. And she was talking about the pain. Like, the pain was really the only thing that was upsetting her the most. And so we talked about pain and death. We had a bit of a spiritual conversation and talked about what that looks like. You don't want to shy away from these conversations because, really, the more information we can give, even in scary situations or hard topics, the better. So I would still ask. Um, and in her sleep, not waking up, and being ill, those are all little symptoms of death, right? So eight hours of sleep is like a mini death to a lot of anxious kids and adults. So being afraid that you're not going to ever wake up is a very common death theme, although never assume. A lot of times I assume things with my own kids, and then I ask them these questions because I want to make sure, and I'm surprised sometimes by their answer because I will think I got it, you know, this is definitely your core fear, and they'll tell me something else. So even if they've had a history of a core fear of something like death, and then they have a new fear that seems kind of obviously related to death, don't ever assume. Always ask the questions of, what would be the worst part of, of that if it happened? And when I ask kids these questions, I like to separate out anxiety and OCD. So I like to personify it. I find that I get, it's kind of like a ninja verbal hack. When you have to talk to kids for like two decades, you develop some pretty good ninja skills on how to get kids to open up and talk a little bit more. And what I have found is when I disarm their fears and I say, what does your, your worry cloud say about that? Or, you know, what does your dictator say is the worst thing that can happen? So instead of saying to them, what's the worst thing that can happen? When I add that little bit of distance from their anxiety and I say, what does your dictator say can happen? It gives them permission to say something crazy or what they might perceive as irrational because I'm separating it from them. Try that at home. That actually really helps a lot with the kids I work with. Okay, Sarah said, thanks, Natasha. I guess I'm also wondering how to support him after I get his answers. Um, and we will go into that. Today is, um, I try to stay on topic because I could go in a million different directions. I do have tons of resources. If you need me to point in, in the right direction, you can go to my website at atparentingsurvival.com. Um, they're literally hundreds, probably maybe not yet thousands, but close of articles, podcasts, and YouTube videos on every single topic. There's a search button at the very bottom of my page. If you type in any topic, I guarantee you I have done a podcast, YouTube video, or article on the topic. So definitely check that out. My YouTube channel has tons of videos, hundreds of videos for kids, and some um, podcast replays and Facebook Live replays for you. And so you can check that out too at youtube.com slash c slash anxious toddler 78 that's a good way to go danielle said we say the worst part about dying is the worrying about dying part true i have a fear of dying from cancer that i haven't chosen that i've chosen to tackle this year i don't have cancer which is a good thing to tackle um and and maybe the fear is worrying about it but i would even go further than that um, because there's a worry about panic or they worry about worrying in general but worrying about a topic tells me there's something more there and so if you have a fear of dying from cancer 
what would be the worst thing that you had? What would be the worst thing about cancer? I mean, these things are obviously bad and horrible. Like nobody wants cancer. Nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to throw up even, right? But we still want to figure out what's the core fear with that. Talking about emetophobia, the fear of throwing up, it's the same thing with that. Um, I can have three different kids with emetophobia, the fear of throwing up. And they can be three very different reasons why um, they're afraid of throw up. And I would approach it therapeutically very differently. So I can have a kid who's afraid that it's going to burn. Um, they don't like the feeling. I hear that a lot from kids with emetophobia. I just don't like the feeling. Then I can have other kids who are like, mortified if somebody sees them throw up, it's going to be embarrassing. So now I'm dealing more with social anxiety. If I tell them, don't worry, it's not going to hurt or don't worry. It only lasts, you know, like a couple of hours and you'll be fine. That's not going to help the kid whose core fear is I'm afraid what other people are going to think. I'm afraid that they're going to laugh at me. I'm afraid they're not going to be my friends, right? If I tell the kid who's worried, it's going to burn. Don't worry. No one's going to laugh at you. Don't worry. Everyone's going to be your friend. They're going to look at me like I have two heads. They're like, uh, thanks. I wasn't worried about that but thanks for that. And that's why it's so important to distinguish which is the core fear. So some of the language that I use is, like I just said before, what's the worst part of? I use that a lot because there's a, there's a couple of reasons why I like that sentence. I like it because it's validating. So when I say, what's the worst part of going to school? I know it's semantics, but you know, trust me, when you sit there and talk to kids for a living, um, you learn these things really quick because it's a very long hour when you're getting, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. It gets long. And so you do learn how to get things out of kids in a better way. Um, I'm not a miracle worker, so if somebody doesn't want to talk, I can't force them. But I do know language, and there's certain language that does help. So when I say, what's the worst part of going to school, I'm validating it in that sentence. And I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but trust me, I have tried both ways for a long, long time. And when I say it that way, kids will respond a lot more often than when I say, what's the hardest part about going to school? Or no, that actually sounds nice. When I say, um, why won't you go to school? Or why are you scared of going to school? I was um, getting, my kids were getting their hair cut last weekend and there was a little girl that came in and she was crying and she was terrified to, to get her hair cut. I just wanted to dive in there and help her, but I couldn't, she was probably about five. And as she's going to sit at the um, stylist's chair, the stylist goes, um, what's, what's scary about getting your hair cut? It's not scary. And I just wanted to like, it's going to sound violent. I just want to hit her in the face. <laughs> you know, I'm not a violent person. But I was just so annoyed by that because I was like, that's the wrong way to talk to an anxious kid, you know? And my daughter had a little candy that I brought and I was like, go give this to her. But her social anxiety was like, I'm not going to do it. So, but the reason why that was not okay, even though she wasn't trying to be cruel, she was just trying to be helpful. Um, it's just hard as a therapist to hear things when you're like, oh, that's so cringy. Because it was, even though she was trying to make her feel better, again, the way that she questioned her was like dis demeaning and like belittling her fear. It wasn't validating. It was like, you don't have a reason to be anxious, so therefore stop. Um, and that's, I'm being extreme with her, but that's an example of how we talk to our kids. And really, if she had said something like, I know that getting your haircut can be scary sometimes. She was five, right? What's the scariest part for you? Now, obviously, they're not training stylists necessarily in how to talk to little kids. It wasn't a kid place, but that's how we want to talk to our kids. Because if she did that, the little kid could have said something like, I'm afraid you're going to cut me, or I don't like the sound of it, or I don't like when it vibrates, you know, whatever. Those are three very different answers, right? So you would then kind of reframe their thinking based on that core fear instead of just this blanket, you don't like haircuts. Let's just talk about rainbows and butterflies and tell you that haircuts are fine and suck it up, buttercup. It's not going to help. Okay. So Joanne says she has really bad panic attacks. Um, I just to address it with her, just have to do reassurance. Yeah. And panic attacks are a bit different. And what I say, um, a lot of times with panic attacks, the core fear is the fear of having another panic attack because panic attacks are very physiological versus an anxiety attack that can be situational and they can happen at any time for any reason that are to that's totally unprovoked. So you, um, I do have a YouTube video, Joanne, you're probably already familiar with that because you've been around for a while, but I do have a, a kid's video on panic attacks that can help. And I have a podcast on panic attacks, so those can help, but really teaching kids that, 
um, panic attacks is it's attack because you're panicking about the attack, right? So it's a physiological misfire. And so I'm having cortisol and um, adrenaline pumping through my body for no reason. And it doesn't feel good. And I don't know why I'm having that. And so I'm going to panic about it instead of writing it out for 30 minutes and then getting to the other side, which I know is super hard and scary because I have had panic attacks when I was in college and I get it. But we want to teach our kids that it's the panic that makes panic attacks such a bad thing. And we can reduce the panic by normalizing it. That can help. So the core fear with panic attacks tend to be panic. Um, and then panic attacks can bloom out where kids don't want to leave their house or they don't want to go to school because they're afraid of getting the panic attack, which is totally understandable. Um, we want to move away from reassurance because if you're giving her the reassurance, what we're also conveying to her anxiety is that she needs you. You are the panacea. You are the cure for her panic attack. And therefore, I've seen separation anxiety be a secondary issue and, and sometimes even become a primary issue because now I have this connection with when I have a panic attack, the only person who can fix this is my mom. And so I tend to have kids record messages to themselves to say, hey, hey, Jennifer, you know, talking to themselves in third person. I know you're having a panic attack right now and I know it's scary and you're probably feeling all these symptoms, but let me just tell you that you are not having a medical emergency, that this is a physiological misfire. You're having a false alarm and it normally only lasts 20 to 30 minutes. So how about you get your mind off of it and here are the things that you can do and then have that person list what they can do, um, things that they like, uh, I'm not really a fan of distraction for anxiety and OCD, but with panic attacks, I am. Because at that moment, they need grounding, they need um, a reset, and they need to not fuel the panic. So I, I recommend that. Hey, Courtney, thanks for joining us. Patricia said, how do you recognize a panic attack or an anxiety attack in a five-year-old? Sometimes it can be hard to differentiate, um, but an anxiety attack, and it really doesn't matter completely because at the end of the day, all kids are hyperventilating and their heart's racing and they're overwhelmed. Um, the only difference is there's, there's no trigger. And so if I'm having an anxiety attack, I'm either about to do something or something just happened to me, or I'm thinking of something that's causing my anxiety and it's getting so overwhelming that now I'm having an anxiety attack. If it's a panic attack, I could be sitting there eating popcorn, watching a movie, totally relax and have one. That's scary. Um, or I could be sleeping and I could wake up and have one. That's overwhelming. And so they're different in that sense. Uh, Kimberly said, my son has OCD and has a hard time with getting things wrong. A word wrong in a new book, we'll have to reread. Shoe tying, he gets so mad at me and himself and it's so hard because it's an everyday experience. I listen, validate that he's frustrated, have him take a deep breath. Any other advice? We call his o OCD King Bossy Pants. Okay, by the way, I love your name, King Bossy Pants. That's so awesome. So... Um, he's having, when he's getting, um, when he's getting things wrong, so a word wrong in a new book, that's a common OCD thing where kids have to read and reread. Um, a lot of times it's because it's just right. They just have to get it just right. Um, sometimes I've seen it with moral OCD where they don't want to lie. And so they want to make sure that they completely read the page and were honest. And so that's a really good example of the core fear could go in two different directions. It could just be just right OCD where it just doesn't feel right. So I have to do it over and over again, or that um, I have moral OCD. I don't want to be a bad person. And so I have to read everything and do it perfectly because otherwise um, what will happen to me? So I would ask, I would ask him um, what would be the worst part? What does, King Bossy Pants say would happen to you if you if you read the word wrong? Or what does King Bossy Pants say if you tied your shoes wrong? Um, and so it's really not just about validating his feelings because with OCD, we really want to get to the core fear and then we want to do exposures through ERP, exposure and response prevention with an OCD therapist to really tackle that. And that's why um, you can miss the boat completely if you're doing an exposure with ERP for OCD that's unrelated to the core fear. And I've had this happen um, with kids that have come to me who have seen other therapists where, you know, they're afraid of germs. And so they're doing exposures around touching germs and then maybe eating some food or something. But when I talk to them, it, their core fear isn't about them getting sick. Their core fear is about getting other people sick. So those exposures were not anxiety producing at all because that's not their core fear. Yes, they're afraid of germs, but only if they touch a doorknob 
and then you touch a doorknob and then you eat some food, now that's a scary exposure for that kid. So it does matter where we're going with it. Uh, hmm, let's see. Mary Klein said, we have this anxiety too, fear of failure and perfectionism. And you really want to, um, you really want to not sit with that, right? So you might have, Mary Klein might have the same thing as Kimberly's kid where fear of failure or perfectionism, but what's behind that? Fear of failure is different for every kid. And so if I fail, what? Then I ruin my reputation. If I fail and I'm not perfect, um, I'm a bad person and I have OCD already, so I feel like um, I'm gonna be a failure. Or I, if I fail, if I fail, this is a common one, then I'm not gonna be successful. And if I'm not successful, then I'm gonna be homeless. And if I'm homeless, I'm gonna die. That one I've actually seen a lot with perfectionism and failure. Or if I'm not perfect, you guys won't love me. And even if that's irrational and you're like, woo, we don't pressure our kids, it doesn't matter what you do, it's what anxiety is telling them. So dig deeper, perfectionism is not at the bottom of the rabbit hole. It's here in the middle and you still have some further room to go. So um, Kylene said, my three-year-old says she's a little bit worried, but when I probe about what she says, I don't know. Uh, well, I guess she then sometimes says yes, that it's a start and starts repeating my words, but my guess is she's just latching on to my suggestions, what's going on. Three-year-old is tricky. And so being able to find a core fear with a three-year-old is not gonna be easy. And a lot of this is planting seeds for the future. So a lot of this for you, Kyleen, is understanding where you're going to be heading. Um, my kids, the minute they come out of my womb, I know, I hope that they're not gonna be anxious or have OCD, but the whole likelihood is pretty high. By my third child, I was very clued into like her behaviors at three when she was holding her bottom and saying, I know poop, I know poop. I knew what was going on. I knew where we were headed. So um, not that we want to like, you know, put that on our kids, but being cognizant and aware is really helpful. So Kylene, your job right now is really to build up her emotional intelligence by labeling her feelings and giving her feeling words so that she knows more words than mad and bad and sad, um, that she can say things like frustrated or anxious, giving our kids good words at three is super important and then watching and being a, an observer and so we really have to be a detective when we are helping our kids especially in toddlerhood but and beyond and so i would be watching her patterns and making connecting the dots for her and you might be wrong and she might correct you over time but she's not going to have the wherewithal to connect the dots for herself so i'll give you a quick example just to make sure that that makes sense when my youngest daughter was um, you know going to preschool or when she was going to swim class, her stomach always hurt. And it took me a little while to realize the connection because like she would have diarrhea. Like swim class, like we had to cancel class a couple of times because she was on the toilet. She could not go. I know too much information. And eventually it became very obvious that it's situational. It only happened when she had to go to swim class. And so eventually I was just saying, your tummy doesn't like swim class. You know, your worry cloud is telling your tummy, we don't like swim class and it's making your tummy upset. And so I helped her connect the dots and I wasn't going to be able to find out what was scary about swim class per se with her, her language skills at three. But over time I was able to find out that she was worried that she was going to sink to the bottom because I gave her the language to start saying, I feel anxious when, and she was able to start connecting those dots. So that will take some time. But um, when you plant those seeds, it's very, very helpful. Okay, so Stephanie said, Miss Six repeats the end of her sentences over and over, probably five to eight, eight times before continuing her thoughts. So that is also really common with OCD. Um, I'm not here to diagnose anyone. Definitely go seek out mental health um, guidance from a trained professional. But I do want to just normalize a lot of what all of you are saying, that repeating words under your breath um, could be OCD. I mean, obviously, some autistic kids do that as well, but we're in an anxiety and OCD support group here, and so I would definitely, um, hopefully she's already in therapy, but you wanna ask her, um, and I don't know if you have a name for your anxiety or OCD, obviously the second theme of this class is name the anxiety OCD if possible, it's very, very helpful, and I would say, um, what, what does Mr. Bossy say would happen if you didn't repeat that? A lot of times, I'm just telling you what other kids' core fears tend to be around that, um, is that they're not saying it perfectly, um, or that they feel like they're not going to be heard. And so the core fear is, um, you know, getting it just right. So I said it, I said it, 
I said it. You know, sometimes there's a certain number, and so they have to just say it at certain times or something bad's going to happen. That's totally different, right? And that's why a behavior, a compulsion in and of itself does not tell you anything about the core fear. It tells you just a little bit, but not much, because the reason why is, is deeper. Even if it's disgust or just grossness or discomfort or just right, that's the core fear, but it's different for each person. So you can have a person who's repeating their sentences because they want to get it just right, and I can have a person who's saying it four times because if they don't do it four times, then you're going to be killed. The parents will be killed. Totally different, right? Susan said, my daughter, seven, has a fear of us, her parents dying. She won't go on play dates away from our home. It's a struggle every morning for school because she's afraid she'll die when she's at school. What is the best way to approach this? And we're not going to talk about approaches, and I know that's frustrating, but if I veer off on every topic, we're going to, this will be a very convoluted class. We're just talking about how to get to the core fear today. You have the core fear, Susan, so that is really good. It sounds like separation anxiety. Um, a lot of times... Let me just make sure. Yeah, because she doesn't want to be away from you. She doesn't want to go to school because she's afraid she's going to die. So it's, it's being away from you. And then you might want to talk to her and say, what does your worry cloud say will happen? How will you die? Now, I know that sounds dark, and we're like, why would you go there? We want to know the nitty-gritty of how deep does her fears go? What does her anxiety say will happen to her? How will she die? A lot of times kids will say, I don't know. And I'll say, well, just guess or ask your worry cloud because your worry cloud's the one bothering you. Because a lot of times the anxiety is like, I don't have to tell her why. I just make her fe fearful and that's enough. We want them to go further. I want them to tell me because the worry and the anxiety or the OCD will provide you with the reasons if asked enough times. Even if it's just grossness or disgust or just death, we want to go down further. Okay, let's see. Danielle said, my son says he... My son says I wash his hands because they're sticky dirty. And when I ask him to explain it, he says it's because he doesn't want to get his toys dirty or messed up. Most of his OCD behaviors are about not using new items and keeping things nice and new. So it sounds like his core fear might be like ruining his toys. And then I'd go further even with that. And I would say to him, I don't know how old he is, but I would say, you know, and I'm just going to use um, Mr. Bossy for OCD and your worry cloud for anxiety just to personify it and show you how I'm personifying it when I'm talking to kids. But then I might say, Danielle, to your son, um, what does Mr. Bossy say would happen if, you're, if your toys got sticky, right? And, and if kids say, I don't know, say, I know, but just guess or go ask Mr. Bossy, what do you think he would say, right? So don't just sit there with accepting no and just be like, he doesn't know, I'm sorry. A little probing and prodding can help. Not too much, but a little bit can help. I get a lot of answers the second time, third time around when I phrase it a little bit differently. And I don't accept no. I just say, well, I know it's hard to know because maybe Mr. Bossy's like, I don't have to tell her the reason or I don't have to tell him the reason. She never asked for the reason. I just say, don't do it. But we want to boss Mr. Bossy back. So let's ask him, hey, Mr. Bossy, you've been bothering me about my toys. Why? What's the worst thing that will happen if they get sticky? Now, he'll probably say, let me see. Well, he wants to keep them nice and new. Oh, no, you're saying sticky or dirty. So um, he might say it's just gross. It will be gross. Um, but he might say they're going to make me sick. He might say they're going to have germs on them. And if kids say they're going to have germs on them, I go further and I say, well, what does Mr. Bossy say is the worst part about germs? I mean, germs are everywhere. And then, well, I might get sick. Or then my friend might touch my toy and then they might get sick. Well, that's different than the other one. And that's why we want to differentiate. Patricia said, can repeating everything, a sister says, can that be OCD? My daughter repeats her sister a lot to the point her sister can't handle it. Um, it's hard to say with just that comment. Uh, I don't know if she has OCD or if she's on the spectrum. I mean, there is um, spectrum behavior where they echo what they hear. And um, so that's not OCD at all. So it just depends. I really can't diagnose anyone or anything, but just give you kind of my opinion on what's going on. Danielle says, we're still working on names. When I asked my son, he thought he was a funny guy. And he said, Danielle Temes. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Okay, but naming it would be a good thing. Janine said, how would I tackle my son's intrusive thoughts that he's going to grow up and kill murder people and go to prison? He has to tell me what the, those thoughts are because it makes him feel better. Okay, well, Janine, I, hopefully you're seeing an OCD therapist um, because that sounds like it could be harm OCD. And again, I'm not here to diagnose, but I'm just to give you my initial impressions on what all of you are talking about. And so when you have harm OCD, 
um, you are, are you're worried that you might harm other people or other people might harm you or you might accidentally harm people. A lot of kids that I see with harm OCD are worried that they are going to kill or harm other people. So I definitely would recommend going to my website at atparentingsurvival.com and go to the search button on the bottom and type in harm OCD. You're going to see that I have um, I've interviewed um, Aaron Harvey on harm OCD. I have interviewed John Hirschfield, who's a great author on harm OCD. I have done kids YouTube videos on harm OCD to help because the the compulsion is the confession. And so a lot of times we're missing this and this isn't what this class is about. So I'll be brief, but we, we miss that. We um, have an intrusive th thought, feeling or image, right? So I'm worried I might harm someone. And then the sink is you. So I tell my mom, Hey, I think I might harm someone. You say, honey, you're so wonderful. You're, you're never going to do that. And I feel better. Whoop. And I just completed the OCD loop. So a lot of times with moral OCD, harm OCD, lots of OCD, the parent is the sink. And I have lots of um, stuff on that. And so hopefully you can get some more information. Okay. Let me see. Mary Klein, it is. My son fears disappointing us too. Natasha, okay, that's not to me. So I'm just trying to get to the comments that are for me. Marco said, any tips on how to help a child with a metaphobia? Tried meds when they've read up online the side effects including, includes nausea and vomiting. I know that's so frustrating. I do have lots of stuff on a metaphobia. Um, I don't mean to keep telling people to go to my website and, and Google it, but if I don't do that, we're not going to really be talking about the particular topic. So we have done Facebook lives on emetophobia before, I'm pretty sure. Um, I pin all of these Facebook live classes up to the top of the group. So definitely check those out. There's like tons and tons of them. And I'm sure emetophobia is there. Also, if you go to my website and go to the search button and type emetophobia, I have done YouTube videos for kids. I have done podcasts on it. And so you can check that out as well. Oh, he gave... So Danielle was saying that her son gave the anxiety your name, <laughs> which is not good. You don't want you don't want it to be your name, right? I mean, if it's if it's funny and it's silly, you know, and we're like, eh, like my son's name is Squishy. I'm like, whatever. But if it's our name, we really don't want them to be calling it our name. That would probably be not okay. Crystal said, best ways to approach fear of being kidnapped. There's zero why why this fear would be relevant that we know of. Okay. Molly has to go. Thank you for joining Molly. And I look forward to having you listen to your um, podcast episode next Tuesday. So thanks for doing that. Um, Crystal, you've been around for a while. So hopefully you know what I'm going to say. But you do not have to have a reason to be anxious. I'm afraid of sharks. I've never seen a shark. Um, I've never been around a shark. I've never been bitten by a shark. It doesn't matter. So a lot of times when we have kids who have anxiety disorders, or anxiety is genetically rampant in the family, they're going to have fears that have nothing to do with what they've experienced. And that's okay. Sometimes we give way too much power in like the why of it. Well, why are they afraid of being kidnapping? Nothing's bad ever happened. Or why are they afraid that I won't come to pick them up? I've always picked them up. Or why are they afraid of the dentist? Nothing bad has ever happened in the dentist. Well, that's probably a bad example because you know bad things happen in the dentist. But I think it's important to not get stuck in the why. If your brain can imagine it, it can happen. Um, with my anxiety, I've always been afraid that someone's in the back seat, you know, and they're gonna kill me as soon as I drive away. I still have that intrusive thought all the time. I don't do anything with it. I don't turn the light on or check because I'm just like, oh well, whatever. That's never happened to me. I mean, I'm sure that like the idea popped up, maybe I watched something or maybe my anxiety was just super creative, but it doesn't matter. You don't have to have an experience for your anxiety to be creative. So um, Samantha said, my 11 year old son and I watch your YouTube video. Why do I have anxiety? It is brilliant way of helping us understand what it is. Thank you. He has trouble trying to convey what he is exactly worried about when refusing to go to school. We have switched schools because it was affecting his attendance, but he has started feeling the same as new school and refused to go one day this week. He said he was worried about old feelings coming up in a new school, but a number of things can trigger him from school. So still yet to find out his core fear. Yeah, and you know, it's a slippery slope, unfortunately, when, when our kids don't want to go to school and then we don't, we switch schools or we have them homeschool. And I'm not um, against homeschooling or switching schools. I think there comes a time where that's important. But I think it's also really good to be aware that if I have a fear of embarrassment or a fear of throwing up or a fear of perfectionism, it's going to go with me wherever I am. And sometimes that's what we see. And we, we want, Samantha, we want your son to start to realize 
and I have YouTube videos on this, and so definitely search my YouTube channel, where the more we give into it, right? And so anxiety wants us to avoid, and the more we avoid, the bigger it will grow. And so helping him personify it and just say, and I don't know what it's called, but if you say, you know, you're Mr. Bossy, I don't, I normally use that for OCD and not anxiety, but you're, you're Mr. Worry. And if he's older, well, he's 11. So maybe he's dictator. I explained to kids what dictator is. So they understand that your dictator doesn't want you to go to school. And if you don't go to school, it's not going to want you to go, you know, leave the house. And it just wants to bring your world in this much, you know, closer. And so, yeah, if you let him win, you won't go to school and you're going to have those feelings. So we have to work through them, not around them. We can't avoid them. And then I would just ask him, what's the worst part about school? And if he doesn't know, um, let me see if he, did he say anything about it? Not really. Um, sometimes I say to kids, there's another language uh, ninja trick. I'll say, if I had a magic wand and I could just wave it around school and get rid of some things, what things would I wave and get rid of? Or if we could just create the perfect school for you, what, what aspects could we get rid of? Now, what they tell you could be really interesting. I would get rid of my PE teacher. She's really mean, and I always feel like she's yelling at me. Or I'd get rid of math. Or, well, I'd get rid of all the kids because I always feel like they're staring at me. Or I'd get rid of my stomach because I feel like I'm nauseous. It, it's interesting. And sometimes you have to kind of probe further because they give you a throwaway answer, but that's something that I do sometimes. Marco said, is EMDR worth trying if you're not convinced that your child's OCD is linked to one key traumatic triggering event that caused it? Um, EMDR is not um, an evidence-based approach. It's not the gold standard for OCD at all. There's been no research so far that says EMDR is effective for OCD. EMDR is fantastic for trauma. It's really good for kids that have experienced trauma. And so um, not against EMDR at all. But if there's no traumatic event, no triggering event, then it is, to me, a waste of time. I would much rather spend all that money on an OCD therapist who's going to use the gold standard treatment of exposure with response prevention because that has been researched and that is the treatment of choice. So there's lots of other treatments out there, uh, but if you go to the International OCD Foundation or anyone else who does research on OCD, they're going to tell you that ERP is really the gold standard of treatment. So you can always find a a trauma or a trigger with, with many OCD issues or anxiety issues because often there's this genetic seed that's waiting to be sprouted and then something happens environmentally and then whoop, there you go, your ugly OCD flower has bloomed. And so more often than not, I have families that will be able to tell me, um, oh, you know, she went to school and she saw someone throw up and it was very traumatic for her and we hyper-focus on that event and therapists hyper-focus on that event when it wasn't that event. We've all seen people throw up. Or, you know, people do die. Grandparents do die. Um, parents move and they have to switch schools and parents divorce and pets die. These are all the trauma that I have been presented with in my office for OCD. And it's not that those things are not uncomfortable and upsetting, but they don't cause OCD. They might trigger the genetic response that was already predisposed, but if you work on that trauma and you get stuck in that trauma, you're really not gonna make progress with the OCD. Uh, Stephanie said, just FYI, Shark Lady Kids book was excellent at leaving my daughter's fear of sharks. <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to read that. That will be helpful. Um, Marco said, and how do you tell if OCD might have been triggered by a key uh, traumatic event? Well, I think um, a good, hopefully a good OCD therapist could tell you that. Um, I don't see OCD being triggered by trauma, like I just said. Um, I know these comments are a little delayed. I think that if you're predisposed to have OCD, a traumatic event could bring it up on, um, but I just don't see that it's causing OCD. I don't see that connected. And Mary Klein said, how do you dig for a core fear when your child gets irritated with the question, what's the worst part of? <laughs> He's on to you, Natasha. He goes mute when we try to ask what's bothering him. This is Mr. Seven, no diagnosis. My kids are on to me too. My son actually turned it around the other day. I'm, I'm, he would not wear his helmet. I posted it in this group. He would not wear his helmet. We got him, um, we got them both hoverboards, which was probably a pretty scary idea. And so they were riding them in the house because we have tile and we had yet to buy helmets for them. No, no, he had helmets. So I was like, you can't even ride it in the house. You have to put your helmet on. And I was like, get off or you're going to lose it forever because you have to wear a helmet and pads. And he said, mom, what's the worst part of me falling? <laughs> it's like, 
it, I had a laugh out loud because it was just so funny that he used my weapons against me. And then I was like, you can fall and hurt your head really bad. Put it on. But I just thought that was funny. So if your child is clued in, um, and then she said, magic wand trick doesn't work either. Should I just take him to therapy and hope they can figure it out? <laughs> Have faith in yourself, Mary. You can do it. You know, our kids, in, unless we have um, a little bit of a tenuous relationship with them, our kids are more likely to open up with us than a therapist. Um, and that's why I really spend a lot of time giving parents the tools, even in my practice, giving the parents the tools. Because if you have a good relationship with your child, your child is actually more likely to open up to you eventually. I mean, yes, take them to a therapist, but don't disempower yourself and think that you don't have the ability to do this yourself because you do. Um, sometimes it's just giving it some space. Um, sometimes it might just be, do you say how old your son is? Seven. Um, yeah, I think sometimes it's just watching it and sometimes it's just labeling it. And so it might be, you know, bedtime seems scary for you and just watching patterns for a while. Sometimes it might be labeling it for him and making assumptions until he corrects you. You know, I know the dark is scary. It's not the dark. <laughs> sometimes I'll do that on purpose with my kids I'll be like I know this is scary it's not that I'm like well I don't know what it is because you're not telling me but maybe it's the dark it's not the dark well then what is it what's your bossy what's your mr. bossy saying so sometimes doing that sometimes taking a break um, because we don't really want to shut communication down crystal said my son has anxiety and OCD and is an ERP therapy for it but he has a lot of different kinds of OCD he has harm OCD contamination OCD he's a perfectionist and deals with religion OCD as well how can I find this, his core fear? Um, so I always talk to kids about, and parents, about the OCD buffet, because I don't want kids to think that they have a zillion different disorders. I don't want parents to think their kids have a, different, different, a zillion different disorders. So you know, when you go to Baskin Robbins, you have 31 flavors. You're at OCD, Baskin Robbins, and you have 31 flavors of OCD. So it's all the same thing. You know, OCD gives you an intrusive thought, feeling, or image that gets stuck in your head and you have to do or avoid something to get some brief relief and then it grows bigger. That's how OCD works. But a lot of times I try to get into these core fears because I want the exposures to be really good. So if it's harm OCD and um, you're calling it religion OCD, it's religion OCD or moral OCD or scrupulosity OCD, it has a million different names, but harm OCD and moral OCD are very, very, um, tight. They like to hang out together because if I kill somebody or harm somebody, I don't feel like a good person, which feeds into my moral OCD. So those two tend to have probably similar core fears of I don't want to be a bad person. Um, but you just ask those things. And perfectionism also is tied to moral OCD as well, because a lot of times if I'm not perfect, I'm bad. If I'm bad, what can happen? And with moral OCD, I really like to go down the rabbit hole and figure out what does bad mean to that child? Is it um, that I'm going to disappoint God, you know, and that's where the religion OCD comes from, the scrupulosity OCD. But some kids have moral OCD and they're not religious. And so sometimes they're afraid that they're going to get locked up. Sometimes they're afraid that their parents are going to reject them. Even if the parents are like, we would never reject him. It doesn't matter. Sometimes OCD will say, your parents aren't going to love you. And so a lot, everything you listed there really goes down to moral OCD or religion OCD. And so I would go back to that and um, find that core fear. Let's see, Cindy said, what is a good response for I'm so fat and I hate my lie? And I hate my lie or I hate my life? Um, it's hard to give a response to that. And Cindy said, 14 year old boy. Let me see if you said anything else. Um, it's really hard to give you a response for that because that is, I don't know if that's related to his core fear um, I don't know if he has OCD and he's checking with you to get some confirmation or reassurance that he's not that. Um, so I would need more information on that to give you a response because that's not life. I hate my life. Um, so if, if he said, I hate my life, and he wasn't just being dramatic, right? So some kids say, I hate my life in the moment that they're being disciplined or kind of more typical normal kid stuff. And other kids are like, you know, that you could see their pain and they're like, I hate my life. Um, I know I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I would say, what's, what's, the, what's the worst part of your life? You know, what, what part of your life do you not like the most? And so I really want to figure out his pain point to figure out. If he's saying, I'm so fat, and he's not fat, you know, we're not going to go into that today because this is just about finding core fears, but I would, would want to know what's the worst part about being fat. Um, so a lot of times, and so she said OCD for sure, 
So if, if somebody's saying I'm fat and they're thin and they have OCD and he's a boy, um, not that it necessarily makes a difference, I would say, um, I would say, well, what would be the worst part about being fat? So instead of swooping in and possibly doing a compulsion with him where you give him reassurance, and this is different if you have someone who doesn't have OCD, who um, is concerned about their weight legitimately, or has an eating disorder, that's totally separate. But if you have a kid who um, has OCD, maybe is hyper-focused on their weight, we would want to say, what's the worst part about being fat? Because then I want to get to what's his core fear. Um, it's disgusting, it means I'm lazy, or... Um, it just gives me a gross feeling. You want to get to that core fear. If you just say, you're not that sweetheart, and he has OCD, we might have just went whoop and completed that OCD loop. Marco says, I'm in the UK and rely on health care provided by the state. We're being offered meds by psychiatrists, but no CBT or e ERP in parallel because of very long wait list. Is there any point starting meds if therapy is not happening in parallel? Um, well, I can't advise you on whether to give your child medication or not, um, but you definitely need ERP to augment the, the medication, um, but medication in itself is still helpful and good. But I really am a believer that you do not have to wait to start ERP. Um, educate yourself. Read Talking Back to OCD by John Marsh. That's a great book on teaching you ERP. If you want step-by-step, -step, I mean, I provide a lot of online resources on what is ERP and how to do it. I have a whole class on parenting kids with OCD that teaches parents how to do ERP at home. Um, in fact, when parents visit me in my practice, the first thing I say to them is that you want to save some time and money because if you do and you're willing to spend three hours um, taking my course online, I can help your child while you learn ERP and you learn how to help your child at home. And so I give them a coupon code to take it for free because I do that when kids come into my practice and they do that and they save five sessions where I don't have to teach them ERP because I want them to do it at home. So definitely, you know, Learn this, the tools. There are tools out there for you to learn this stuff yourself and start implementing it. All too often, we wait too long um, for the right professional, and we're wasting valuable time. There's good information out there on it, and people can walk you through and teach you. Kylene said, after you're, after you're confident you got to the core fear, then what do you say? Well, and we're not going to go into that today because I know that that is everything, but Today is just about getting to the core fear because then it's all about treatment, right? How do we face our fears? How do we get into the core fear? Um, I've done a zillion classes on that and they're pinned to the top. My website is full of, I have, I think I'm at 150 podcast episodes that will tell you exactly how to face core fears. If you want step-by-step, -step, I offer online classes at um, anxioustolerance.teachable.com is my class. And um, let me see. See if I can double type this. And you can do things yourself. So I'm not very good at multitasking. I don't know if I did a typo, but who knows? Maybe. Uh, but you can take the power and you can learn these things. And um, telling you how to face, how to help your child with their core fear is a longer process than just a Facebook Live class. Um, but there is a lot of hope. I, I give a lot of information out on my podcast for free, my YouTube channel. And if you need that step-by-step, -step, um, I have my classes. And um, along with my classes, I actually have an AT Parenting Community website. Not website, but I have an AT Parenting Community that not only, you know, hand-holds you. So a lot of people take my class, and then they join this community where we, they have daily access to me. And we dive very deep. I know those people. If they're having an issue, they can ask me direct questions in the forums or in our other private Facebook group, and they get they can get daily support through there. So there is a lot of help for you. Um, just tap into that. So I just want to read really quickly um, a couple of these comments, and then we'll end. So Teresa, I already read yours. Kelsey said her three-year-old will also refuse to go upstairs. And so we, we talked about how to deal with three-year-olds. And Amy said that her daughter is afraid of um, people getting hurt. And so um, that seemed like a really obvious core fear to me. She said that her, her daughter has a fear of something bad happening to family members. She always has bad dreams about these things happening. Um, so that seems like the core fear. Eliza said that the assistant principal of her son's school keeps telling her that her son needs to tell him when he has an issue with another child. And I keep telling him that gives him anxiety to talk to authority figures and he gets scared. So I, if I can get advice on what to tell them to do, that would be great. And, and really, I want to say to Eliza, um, 
that if we know that the core fear is talking to authority figures, we want to figure out what that is. So what's the worst part about talking to authority figures? What's, what are you, what does your worry cloud or your dictator say would happen if you talk to authority figures? And then we don't want to always go and smooth everything out for our kids. Um, we, we want to back up. And so sometimes we have to go in there and maybe address that with the principal and say, look, one of his core fears is talking to authority figures. So obviously he's not gonna be able to come to you. But at the same time, we want to say, but we're going to work on it. And so can he come and talk to the front desk lady? You know, maybe she's less threatening to me or to him. And so we don't want to just protect our kids and give in. Finding the core fear doesn't mean that we accommodate the core fear. Finding the core fear doesn't mean that now we're going to acquiesce to the core fear and give our kids a bunch of excuses because that's their core fear. Finding the core fear means now I know where we need to move further into what we need to lean into, what we need to encourage more. And so we want to find the least um, overwhelming entry point to that anxiety. And so if it's going and talking to the front desk lady or going and talking to a different admin person, we want to encourage that. We want to tell the principal, or was it assistant, the assistant principal, that we're coming up with a plan. Here's the deal. This is my, my son's problem right now. This is his anxiety. We're working on it, but he's not there yet. And so he's not going to come to you but he can come to blah, blah, blah. Maybe he can go to his teacher or maybe he can go to me. Um, whatever entry point you can find, but you wanna start working towards it and not just smooth the road. Because if we smooth the road too much, then when they hit the first bump when they're 22, they're gonna be like, what the heck was that? I don't know, I've never felt a bump before. How do I handle this? Let me go call my mom. We don't want that, right? We wanna foster independence. Stephanie said, thank you for your responses. I think I was just worried about doing more damage by pressing the six for more info. Yeah, and I, I don't think you can do more damage. We don't want to ruin our communication, but we don't want to like put it off to the point where we don't communicate at all. And so it's finding entry points. It's finding um, planting seeds, trying to talk about things in different ways. Talk about your own anxiety or your own worries in a healthy sort of way and model it for them. That helps, that helps and opens communication too. When we talk about things outside of them that seem similar to them, or we read books that are related to their fears, but not about not about them or making connections to them. That's another way to communicate. There's so many ways to open up communication other than just talking directly. Um, and then Sarah said, my son has a fear of being killed or hurt. He takes any negative interaction with a grown up a peer straight to heart, regardless of what it was, a strange look, an unkind word, being reprimanded. He always says, they're going to kill me. They're going to hurt me. This severe anxiety is causing some real problems to manifest at school. Would love if you had any thoughts related to this. Um, so that's his core fear, right? That he thinks if someone's upset with him, they're going to kill him. So letting kids know, and this is a good um, kind of wrap up of what I wanted to say. When we tell our kids what their core fear is, right? We can talk about, um, you know, your worry clouds making you think that everyone's going to kill you. What's the likelihood of that happening? Especially if it's anxiety. If it's OCD, I don't talk to OCD. And so I wouldn't go into a deep conversation, but um, we want our kids to realize that's your core fear. Your core, your core fear tells you that anyone can just look at you and make you feel like they're going to kill you. And you'd want to do exposures around that. Um, and we're not going to get into that today, but I would do exposures around that, around disappointment, upsetting people, purposely upsetting people in a mild way to get um, desensitized to that feeling. But we want to connect the dots for our kids. So getting them to realize their core fear is really helpful. Once, like my son, once he realized his core fear was poking, it was really random, but he was afraid of shots. He was afraid of cacti. We live in the desert. There's a lot of them. And being afraid of a cactus um, actually can be quite a big phobia because you they're everywhere. So you have to like walk around. You have to cross the street. You have to avoid them everywhere. So that became a big issue. He was afraid of someone poking his stomach. Um, and it took me a while to realize that the core fear with all of these things, it just seemed like he was randomly afraid. He was afraid of bees because they were going to sting him. He was afraid of fire ants because they were going to sting him. It took me like probably about a year until finally he said, you know, I was like, well, what's the worst part about that? Or what's the hardest part about that? What's the worst part about that? And it was always, I'm going to be poked. I'm going to be poked. I'm going to be poked. And then now I've, I've explained that to him. Your core fear is being poked. Cacti poke you. Needles poke you, right? Bees poke you. And now he's even aware of it. He's like, yeah, I don't like to be poked. So we need to do exposures around being poked. And we did. We actually got a paper clip and um, I would poke him. <laughs> it sounds cruel, but I would poke him like, and he would earn prizes and he knew we were doing exposures and he 
now gets he gets blood work without a problem. He used to have to be held down. He would not go outside because he was afraid of bees. He goes outside now. Um, it was all because, and then he'd have to lift his shirt and I'd have to poke him in the belly because that was one of his core fears. But he knows that being poked is not bad now. If I didn't do that, if I didn't realize that that's his core fear, I would have not been able to kind of get rid of that octopus of fears that were kind of going from that one core fear. So I hope that makes sense. Okay, well, I want to run over. I want to respect your time. We will be back. Um, I do these monthly classes every month, the last Wednesday of every month at this time. So if you're enjoying these, please keep a lookout, write it on your calendar so that you're here live because it's really fun when you're live. And come back next week because if you're enjoying this and you're like, oh my gosh, I want to get some more help. I'm going to be in here all next week doing my self-care series on how you helping yourself will actually help your kids. Um, we're not talking about bubble baths and chocolate and Netflix, although those are three of my favorite things. Not the bubble bath, but the chocolate and Netflix for sure. But we're going to be talking about your mindset and what we project onto our kids and our own support and how our body gives us clues on um, our own triggers and our own internal responses. So I hope to see you there. The first Facebook Live will be on Tuesday. Um, I'll give you more in details about the time um, as we progress. So have a great day. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Hi, I'm a mom of a daughter with OCD. I live in South Africa um, and it's a country that doesn't have a lot of resources for children's mental health and specifically OCD. I really was at my wit's end on how I'm going to support my child, how I'm going to do ERP, how I'm just basically going to, to parent a daughter with OCD in a country that has little to no resources. And at times it got just debilitating for us as a family. And I was super lonely, um, people weren't listening, I didn't have any support. The AT community has been an absolute lifesaver. Natasha has been instrumental in the past few months in helping us set up ERP challenges, going through them step by step, being supportive each and every step of the way. Joining the AT parenting community has been one of the best things I could have done for me and my family. Uh, Natasha has built this community and it is exceptional. I've learned so much, the support is fantastic. It's, it's just been life-changing for my daughter. Um, it's so nice to be able to ask her live questions in office hours. She's there, she responds. Uh, her live videos every week where she asks us what we need her to talk about. Uh, also her forums, again, where you can ask questions. She's on there all the time. She is very present. The resources she has provided, the worksheets. Uh, there are so many things in this AT parenting community that are beneficial. Natasha gives you so much of her time and her expertise. She's there to answer your questions, so it's such a personal way of getting help and support when it's much needed. Personally, the community has helped me because I feel like I needed my support. And then you have the added bonus of this fantastic community of parents who are going through such similar things and suddenly you're empowered and have ways of accessing help and making a real difference to your family. And also just the support of all the other moms and dads, it's really good, you know, we laugh together, we cry together, we fail together, we succeed together, um, and, and everybody gets it, everybody gets it, and it's such a nice community to be with, and I hope you join us, you won't be disappointed, try it out.